let's talk uh, to our regular guest of a Monday night, uh, Conservative commentator Connor Tomlinson. Good evening, Connor. Evening again, Kevin. Uh, the BBC, uh, it will never learn its lessons, will it? Uh, that it's going to go press ahead uh, by appointing Jess Bremer, uh, who's got a long track re record for ranting on social media against Brexit, ranting against Boris Johnson, classic BBC Guardianista type. Uh, she's going to take over as executive head of their news channels. Uh, and therefore, we're supposed to believe in the impartiality of the BBC. How can we if they give a woman like that the job? Well, after a day of communist insurrectionism in the capital, it's quite nice to have a pinata that both sides of the aisle can be. Obviously, most of the political right in Britain believe that they've been ostracised from the dialogue by the BBC's partisanship, and the left wing hate the BBC because they've killed Doctor Who over the last couple of years. And don't worry, lads, I can sympathise with that as well. <laughs> but I think when we were examining Jess Bramart, we should probably go down the rabbit hole of her career history, because as much as she's been deleting 16,000 tweets, yeah, the good point, Brexit that. stuff, um, <laughs> including, I mean, look, I'm not going to talk about anti-Boris stuff at this point because we're no fans of the man either after the last couple of months. And one particular job application interview that said non-binary candidates only, how diverse and inclusive, <laughs> it's more about the stuff that she actually hasn't bothered to hide, but hasn't been picked up on that's more interesting. So as you said, she worked for the Huffington Post before. She resigned because... Huffington Post went woke, went broke, and BuzzFeed, their parent company, cut the Huffington Post UK staff. Since then, she's failed upwards and is now pending to work at the BBC. The interesting thing is who her fellow works for. And he was the Huffington Post's, or was it BuzzFeed actually, BuzzFeed UK's uh, political editor. And then he went on to work at The Guardian. Oh, I, God, knock me down with a feather. <laughs> well, the interesting thing then is to combine the BBC and The Guardian. A lot of people don't know, the BBC is actually the leading purchaser of The Guardian newspaper every year using the licence fee. And they spend, and I want to get this figure right, £139,000 a year of taxpayer money on 1,300 copies weekly of The Guardian newspaper and an extra £18,000 uh, for The Observer as well. <laughs> so I guarantee as soon as she gets into office, they're the only people who buy those things papers. Are going straight up. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I'm pretty sure my sister bought it once to rhyme, line the rabbit's cage. But yeah. other than that, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm starting to think the Guardian newspaper sales might keep going up as soon as the BBC uh, 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 have her in. On a serious basis, though, you, you know, mm. uh, journalists... You know, a lot of us are, are basically employed for our opinions. We're employed yes. to be opinionated. Uh, you know, talk radio allows allows me to say what I think about anything. Uh, and uh, for the various newspapers I've always worked for, uh, have hired me to voice my opinions. Uh, that's okay. That's uh, radio stations. That's newspapers. That's the way it is. But the BBC stakes its existence on the impartiality, the unbiased nature of its news coverage that every licence fee payer can rely on. And that's important because uh, licence fee payers, they pay 159 quid a year. Uh, you don't pay that for one particular opinion. You pay it for unbiased news coverage. How can we rely on unbiased news coverage if uh, the uh, obvious extreme left winger, Jess Bremar, is in charge of news? Well, I don't think we can rely on unbiased coverage in any facet of the BBC, and that's been a lot of, I know Calvin uh, Robinson does a lot of work on this, and Darren Grant, etc., with the Funder BBC. That's been the argument for scrapping the licence fee wholesale for years. And as much as people can turn around and say, oh, well, they appointed, you know, the new head, Tim Davies, he's uh, involved in the Conservative Party. What a lot of people don't know is that recently the BBC internal documents and a, a publicly available post about their diversity inclusion and equity program it's funny how that little acronym spells out die because that's exactly what it's going to do to the bbc <laughs> um the plan involves not only having all of your audiences represented including racial hiring practices so for research positions that can only be bame only candidates because for some <laughs> reason i would be incapable of researching because i'm white but also because <laughs> they said they wanted at least 50 percent of their gay employees to be out at the workplace now it's kind of strange that they're going to be going around doing some sort of inquisition asking their gay employees yes or no uh 
It's, it's pretty weird that they're trying to do that to hit some tick box quota, and that's under the supposedly more conservative leadership. So the issue is, it doesn't matter about party affiliation, it doesn't matter about whether or not they're honest about their views in the job interview, you're always going to get infiltrationists, you're never going to get it to be non-partisan. And as long as it's taxpayer funded, it's never actually going to be accurately representative of the people that are forced to pay for it. So I'm very much on the side, and, and I think a lot of people have become on the side of this, of make the BBC live and die of its own merits of uh, being a subscription-based service and see if they can actually make some decent programs that caters to the people that want to watch it for once couldn't agree with you more it should uh, live or die on its own production if they put popular programs on they can sell lots of advertising uh, and the commercial imperative uh, would give the bbc the shot in the arm it so desperately needs uh, but uh, you're talking about an organization uh, you alluded it to to it there uh, connor that's currently spending a hundred million pounds on diversity mm. and not nearly as much money on programs uh, the new director general the newish director general uh, came out fighting he looked uh, to be an encouraging appointment in so far as he said i'm going to uh, stop the bbc being so left-wing i'm going to stop it being so woke uh, and has ca uh, ca proceeded uh, to do nothing of the sort i think he's as bad as the rest of them Absolutely. And he oversaw, I forget the woman's name, who was, uh, I know this was covered before, she was doing about three days a week for a ridiculous salary just to tell everyone that she's racist around the office. Isn't that wonderful? I'm glad that you're an expert it's, on that. It's uh, June Sarpong. That's the person, she's yes. Head of okay. diversity. Uh, yes, uh, uh, she gets a, 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 an extraordinary amount of money, about 200 grand for three days a week. Ah, money well spent. It's not an extortion racket whatsoever. The other one was uh, Anne Foster, actually, as well. I remember that name because she was part of the BBC's diversity workforce and she's one of the heads of these schemes. And it's funny, actually, again, as I said, that you can't rely on party affiliation or professed ideology to actually be conservative or representative of a lot of social conservatism in the country because she's part of, and it's on her website, she brags about it, and I want to get the name right again, the Prime Minister's Race Disparity Advisory Group. So she is oh, part yeah. of a group headed by the so-called conservatives that's not based on individual freedom, allowing people to have merit. It's based on making equal outcomes, which is a communist presupposition, based on people's racial identity, as if race somehow controls behavior. So again, one of these race realists and, and social communists um, is being employed by the so-called conservative party and the so-called more conservative leaning, more representative BBC. You can't trust these people for a minute. Uh, I agree. Uh, you alluded earlier, Connor, to the uh, communist tendencies of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, mm. I'm not quite sure what you were getting at, but my theory on these people, I, I think it's more than a theory, uh, just as I do not believe that uh, the Black Lives Matter organization actually care that much about racial issues. They're more interested in smashing capitalism, destroying the nuclear fa family and defunding the police. Uh, I don't believe that Extinction Rebellion people are that bothered about climate change. Uh, they just use it as a cloak under which they can smash capitalism, hammer the government and generally rail against uh, the Brit Britain's traditions. That's absolutely true, and this is one of these specialist subjects for me, because after the Cenotaph was defiled with their, their reef stunt last year, I wrote a piece for Daily Express, it made it to the sort of digital front page, and that was the night before I was debating one of Extinction Rebellion's founders at Durham Union, uh, at the university digitally, and I made it to their Twitter, so I was happily public enemy number one for the afternoon. The thing is, the founders... <laughs> I've been there Roger many Allen, times, mate, don't worry. <laughs> oh, it's a great club, isn't it? Uh, it's free drinks on Saturday. Um, so founders like Roger Hallam, etc., they've turned around and said, some people will need to die for democracy to be overthrown, that the it's not about the climate, it's about dismantling patriarchy, white supremacy and heteronormativity, so apparently being straight's a problem too for the for the environment, um, and also <laughs> during my Durham debate with the Extinction Rebellion co-founder, uh, uh, I believe I know is Claire Farrell, and you can check me on that one, I put it in an article that I wrote for the Federalist about climate lockdowns actually, because it was proposed, she proposed recycling lockdowns to decelerate capitalist growth and institute a form of socialism which also deals out race reparations mm -hmm. it, it's a big mental mind map, I'm sure we're far too intellectually inferior to actually understand how that's going to save the planet, um, but I don't believe Extinction Rebellion has the best yeah. aims at heart for the environment or the British people. They, they clearly want to use the environment as a Trojan horse for their grand social exactly plan. Exactly right.
Exactly right. Yeah. And if they really wanted to protest about climate change or, or the damage that humans allegedly do to the environment, uh, they wouldn't be uh, in the middle of St. Martin's Lane with a stupid big pink table uh, railing against corporations and evil capitalist companies. They'd be outside the Chinese embassy mm. because nothing we do will make any difference. The Chinese uh, could be persuaded to stop polluting the uh, world to the tune of 28% of global uh, uh, carbon emissions. If we could persuade them to do something about it, then Extinction Rebellion would be doing something. However, they don't do that because I don't think they really care. Well, it's not that they don't care. It's they don't want to admit someone that could be tied to their side is incorrect because then you'd have to admit all sorts of dire humanitarian issues have been committed by the Chinese communist regime, which have broadly put themselves under the socialist rubric. Actually, in that debate I had, one of the I believe he was a Labour momentum activist, came out and defended China in many respects and then tried to then retroactively claim that China was a capitalist country when people were throwing themselves off the top of buildings because they couldn't escape their workplaces. That's not capitalism, that's slavery, and there's a very distinct difference. They also, Extinction Rebellion, if they really cared, they'd be offering a lot more solutions. I had spoke to, so at my university when I was uh, an undergrad, I spoke to the one of the scientists who authored their white paper, and the white paper essentially amounts to claim a climate emergency. Now I've done more actual legislation in my green papers. So for a lot of people that don't know, I'm the policy director of the British Conservation Alliance. We're one of the largest campus based environmentalist action networks in the UK. Big name, but it's a, it's a big claim for us. And I've just worked on a paper, I believe it's releasing next week with the Adam Smith Institute talking about a lot of the market-based practical environmental solutions. Because if you spend all everyone's money on these big problems, Everyone else is on the hook when those from the, when those uh, solutions to those problems go wrong with the government spending. So if we if we allowed the entrepreneurs to be rewarded for the solutions, then we'd reap the benefits of the clean air, clean water, etc., and they get paid for all the inventing they do. But because of the aversion the extinction rebellion had to capitalism yeah. for some sort of nebulous Marxism, they ignore all the practical solutions and then said go give us all the power and we'll promise we'll be really nice when we're controlling your lives we tried that with lockdown it didn't work i don't think we want to try it for the sun monster uh totally agree uh connor always a pleasure to talk let's do it again next week connor tomlinson there conservative commentator with his regular slot of a monday night i'm kevin